Welcome to the Tennis Junkies Pod, the tennis hub for all things rackets, string, coaching, interviews, and more. Hey there, Tennis Junkies. So I wanted to talk with Adam Friel. He works over at Diadem and works on some super cool stuff that we're going to talk about in this upcoming episode. Um, he does a bunch of stuff with um, motion tracking, analytics, things like that with um, the tennis rackets and tracking motion. And we'll, we'll get more into that into the episode. Um, I just kind of wanted to let you guys know that um, I knew him and got to meet him from a bunch of Facebook groups that I'm a part of. And uh, Adam's been super supportive, supportive of me throughout my whole tennis journey, um, whenever it comes to rackets and string and coaching tips and building my website, building my YouTube channel, like literally everything Adam has been super supportive. Um, so it's really cool to actually sit down and talk with them and kind of interview him a little bit, um, get to hear his opinion on a bunch of stuff in the tennis industry. So hope you guys enjoy it. Okay, so I'm here with Adam Friel um, on the first official Tennis Chunkies podcast episode, and um, I just kind of wanted to ask first for you to just introduce yourself and kind of explain what you do. Sure, so I'm Adam Friel. Um, I'm a coach and master racket technician. Um, I've coached at a couple of different academies, and I work with Diadem for the MRT stuff. Cool, cool. So I have a, um, about nine questions that I kind of wanted to go over with and pick your brain a little bit. Um, everything tennis related and um, things you do. So um, for number one, I just want to talk about how did you get into tennis? Um, that's actually more of a funny story than probably anything I have. So I was actually, I, I played almost every sport in high school, middle school, all that. And I was actually running track. And for whatever reason, there was like a bad practice with everyone on the team. And the coach kind of just put us all together. I was like, listen, you guys don't want to run track? There's a tennis court right over there. Go join the tennis team. So a bunch of my friends and myself just went over and like, sounds like a great idea and started playing tennis. That's kind of cool. Like, it seems like most people I talk to, it's not like an intentional thing. Whenever they started playing tennis, it was almost like accidental. Um, yeah. It was, and like, it was it, yeah, it was, it, it's actually, that's like the same story as my roommate, I believe, was that he was doing track and then his, his track coach was like, please, I need, I need people for my tennis team. And so then he eventually did it. And now that's all he does. So yeah. it's kind of cool. Take any way you get into it, but it's fun once you do. Right. Um, all right. For number two, I have, what was your first racket you remember getting? Um, but mainly, which racket did you play most of your competitive career with? So I'm a little embarrassed over the uh, first racket choice. Um, I went into Sports Authority after I got on the tennis team and saw this uh, Prince Silver, like 115 square inch racket or whatever. And it was like $260, like, it's expensive. It must be good. Let me try it right. out. <laughs> That's really so funny. It, but definitely not a great developmental choice on my part. Yeah. And what, what one would you say you did most of your uh, competitive play with? Um, I would have to go with the Wilson Pro Staff. Um, I used it my first year into college, and I kept playing with it until a year out, and then they discontinued it, and tried some other ones and I actually had um, a company Vantage make me, you know, customized 90 square inch rackets that were the same specs. Uh, I couldn't leave for a while. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. I, I've never heard of Vantage. Are, are they still in business or? I, they are still around. Oh, I um, cool. emailed them like a month ago because I was trying to sell some off and I lost the trap door and I just emailed them and they're, they're still going. That's cool. That's kind of, that's really cool. Yeah. I, which, um, which one of the pro staffs were you using? Was it like the white and red? Was it so that one? First one I had was, it was the white BLX. Mm -hmm. It was white, red and, and gold. And then I used the, um, I think the next one was the same thing, but black or vice versa, whichever one was first. Then it was yeah. like the measuring stick ones and I think that was the last one before they switched to the red 97s, which were awful. I hated them so much. Yeah, I hate those. Those are literally my least favorite version of all the pro staffs. Yep. That, that's funny. I feel like most competitive players, like at some point, went through a pro staff phase, like in some way or like form. Um, so it's kind of cool to hear that you you actually use that as well. Oh, you have to. I mean, the Wilson marketing yeah. for the pro staff is it's almost unmatched. Right. Like it, it, you look at it and you're like, I think I'm good enough to play with that. And you buy it. And there you go. <laughs> That's funny. Um, okay. So 
kind of shifting into the coaching world. Um, so what, what prompted you to get into the coaching world? And, um, then the next question is what do you enjoy the most about it? Sure. So I don't think anything drove me into coaching. Um, I think I originally started doing it was, it was probably because my first boss in the tennis world, cause I, I got obsessed with it once I was in college. Um, I was in school for elementary education and my boss, you know, I talked to them all the time. I was like, Hey, we, we run like kids classes. Why don't you help us out with that? And I started helping out. And I, I loved it. It was, it was right up my alley. It was sports. It was working with kids. It was, you know, like a match made in heaven. It was perfect for me. Um, now I, I couldn't stop if I wanted to. It's, you know, it's a job. I want to be a coach. That's, that's what it is. Yeah. That's cool. So what, what would you say is your favorite part of it out of, out of everything? Um, I think I'll be a little bit selfish on this one. I like proving people wrong. I love when I get that kid who's, you know, the typical, he's so unathletic, he'll never be good. And, you know, I just have one of the kids I'm coaching now. He was labeled as super unathletic, all that. He just won three level sixes in a row. Wow. Yeah. So it's, that's cool. That, that's what I love. Like getting this kid who wants to be number one in the world to, you know, he was actually told like, I can't teach you how to serve. You have to do it on your own. To now winning tournaments and yeah it's i love that's like that wrong yeah that's cool i i uh, i asked a couple of friends the who are doing that professional tennis management program at hope with me and um the most of them said something along the lines of like working with the higher level players and it, i think it's really cool that, that you say that that's your your favorite part is kind of proving people wrong and taking on the kids who a lot of people think would be really hard to coach with so yeah, that's honestly, really cool. You want to work with whoever wants to have the biggest dream. You want to be a pro and you put everything into it. Uh, I'm right there with you. We'll, we'll do everything we can. Yeah, that's that's really cool. That's like that's a really encouraging thing to hear. I think for a lot of prospective um, coaches, it seems like, especially with like the whole country club um, aspect, you get a lot of like coaches who either won't put in the effort um, with kids who might not be athletically inclined from the start. Um, and I think that's become like a really big problem, especially with country clubs and like these huge academies popping up that are like billions of dollars to go to. And yeah, I'm, I'm, that's really cool to hear. Um, okay, so shifting into you and your playing, um, what competitive level did you personally get to? I know you said that you played in college. But, um, so where, where did you go to college? What, what division was it? That sort of thing. Um, I went to a D3. Um, I actually originally went for academics because I, I started tennis when I was 17. I really didn't have a, a dream of playing. But the coach kind of talked me into it. He's like, yeah, just join the team. We could use you. It'll be fun. And um, I ended up becoming the number one on the team in a couple of years. And I, I did pretty well. Um, I didn't play a ton of junior tournaments. I think I played a total of like two and then maybe like two more when I was an adult. Um, I kind of focused more on the coaching route, but my biggest playing career was probably in college. Okay, cool. So like during college, you, you just said you don't play that many junior tournaments. Mm -hmm. I, I assume like UTR probably wasn't a big thing back then, if it was even a thing. Um, so like I, I kind of coming up with this question on the spot. What are your thoughts on UTR and USTA? And if I were a player getting into tennis, for example, which one should I focus more on playing? Um, actually, I don't think you should focus on either one of them. Um, I'm big on growth mindset, big on making sure you're the best player you can be. If your focus is elsewhere, you're not putting your all into it. Um, I think they are great indicators for college coaches to kind of see what level you are to see where you could fit in their team or if you, you know, you might not have a shot. Um, I think that's their biggest use. I think the UTR has added that kind of bonus with USCA where USCA was, you could pretty much just play as many tournaments as you could and eventually you'll win a couple and you'll shoot up ranking spots. But with UTR now it's, if you do that, you're also going to play a bunch of kids and your UTR might not go up as much. So you could have a ton of sectional points, but your UTR is still going to be a little bit on the lower side. So it gives the college coaches a much better angle to see what kind of true player you are. Okay, cool. That's kind of, that's good to hear. I feel like a lot of coaches are one way or the other. Um, a big part of it could be because like UTR might be sponsoring so-and-so club. Um, I know that's kind of the case here where like UTR is trying to kind of take over a lot of these big clubs we have. Um, 
mm-hmm. which I know you know Dustin. So like I don't know if he's talk, ever talked to like like about T Bar M Racket Club here, but they're they're like a huge one where they're trying to get like UTR constantly. Mm-hmm. And it's one of those things where like as a player, it's like cool. I can play as many tournaments as I want and it's like a variety of players and that's fun. But from a coach standpoint and from a I guess matured player, um, it kind of bothers me how much people focus on the numbers. Um, and yeah. I, that, that was a big problem for me whenever, like, so like my junior and senior year of high school, I was trying super hard to get like to the D3 level. And I was like focusing so much on my UTR level. So whenever it would only go up like 0.02, and I was losing my mind. Like I just, I mentally couldn't handle that. And I couldn't focus on like my actual tennis. And so I, I'm glad to hear another coach is like, not me like, yeah, go USTA or go UTR. So that I'm glad to, to hear that. I mean, they're both tools. You just got to use them accordingly and see what works best for you. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Um, okay. So I want to kind of move into what you do over at Diadem because you know I'm super interested in all that. Um, sure. So for this first one, I want you to just kind of give an overview of what you're doing with the, with the Racket Lab, with the hitting lane. Um, I saw a Facebook video that you posted a while back, which on, on the video portion of the, of the podcast, I want to try and throw it in there. Um, but it was you with, um, you were showing the analytics of a guy with an E-zone and two elevates. Um, and you were talking about sort of like the swing speed um, and swing path of the three rackets combined compared. So it'd be really cool if you could, could talk a little bit more about that kind of stuff. Sure. So I don't remember exactly which one specifically you're talking about, because I've done quite a few sessions since we started um but basically you know it's it's another one of those tools it, it's super cool it, it's really awesome to be able to see like okay you can swing faster this with this one you know you your your angle on impact is like way off on this one it, it's not really going to work once it's at a certain zone you know especially because we're in a controlled environment so if we go outside and you start using that that like 12 degrees might turn into 17 degrees which is going to be you know, going from here to here. And that's, that's a lot of distance on the court. So it, it just gives a ton of analytics and it, it's honestly, I think it's really helped improve my coaching as well because it can kind of show like what problems lie in what kind of techniques and what causes more inconsistencies and stuff like that. Cool. Um, as far as the hitting lane, it's, it, man, it's super cool. It's, there's nothing like it around the world. It's, it's a it's a dream to work there and, and to be able to see all this kind of on the forefront of what could be the next biggest technological advantage in tennis. Yeah. Yeah. I um I well, I was supposed to be taking a trip to the national campus on Tuesday with the um whole PTM guys, but I actually just got COVID, so I, I'm not able to go. Um, which is really upsetting because I, w- I wanted to try so hard to figure out how to get down there um, and get over at the Diadem head- headquarters in some way. Um, so hopefully I can do a trip like that. But for people who haven't seen the hitting lane, it's totally worth like looking up YouTube videos on it. It's super cool. Um, and so I know that you, like I've always thought of it as like the video game tracking technology where you yes. like put the little nodes on everyone and it's mm-hmm. super cool. Um, so how do you track the actual racket? Do you put, do you put, um, like trackers on the racket or does the cam do the cameras just pick that up no that's that's actually the same thing they use the nodes and everything just like i it's exactly how i describe to little kids i'm like you ever see how they make video games we're gonna do yeah. the exact same thing we're gonna put you on, up on this screen and they, they're like no way like this is so, cool. <laughs> so right. we we put um it's 17 nodes in total i'm pretty sure i think it's 14 on the body and then there's three on the rack um and then we have the um the motion capturing cameras that track everything and feed it through the computer system and the AI program kind of shoots it out and gives you all the different speeds, like the, the swing speed and all the different angles and all that. Cool. Cool. Um, so in terms of like, I, well, I, with your coaching, you do, it seems to me like you do a lot of juniors, probably mainly juniors. Do you typically take all your juniors to do that so that you can kind of get the analytics or do you wait for them to ask? ago um so i don't like pressuring anyone to do anything they don't want to so most of my players know i work for diadem um they always see me wearing the shirts whatever they always ask i'm like yeah i I do all this and this and i'll every once in a while i'll show them a video or stuff and then if they ask then i'll say yeah absolutely come in we'll do a session 
we'll, we'll try it out. But I never, I never try to push them into that. I want it to be their decision. You know, if they're really into it, awesome, come by. But if they're more, you know, I, I teach some recreational players. I'm not going to force them to be like, hey, you have to get into diet and we have to see these analytics. Like, they're just there to have fun. That's not yeah. really up their alley. Yeah, I think that's kind of cool whenever I think about um, players who, like, are – equipment nerds compared to just like pick up a racket and play like um yeah it's just like I have my doubles partner in high school he was he was pretty good he was definitely better than me um so he was like in like the eight eight and a half UTR range so like he like knew what he was doing and he was playing with the Wilson Ultra 105 um with the open like the 16 by 15 pattern and he was yeah. breaking a racket or uh, breaking a string roughly every hour to two hours and he was just like, I, I don't know why. Like, I've been using this racket forever. I'm like, yeah, like, you've gotten better than four years ago. Yeah. And so then I handed him, like, an E-Zone or I don't remember. Maybe it was just, like, the normal Ultra. And he hated it. And he hit, like, two balls. And he's like, no, this thing's terrible. So we had to go through all these different strings and stuff. But it's interesting to me that, like, if I was taking lessons from you and I knew about that, I'd be all over it. Like, all oh, over it. But That's like, our, our biggest client is anyone yeah. who's a racket or they come in, they're like, this is the coolest thing ever. Like, <laughs> give me everything show me all of it yeah get and like uh, of those and it, it's fun because i get to you know talk nerd with them i get to be like okay so this is why this doesn't really work and i, I can really go into the specifics rather than you know some of the top juniors that come in um they're they're there to really improve their game but they don't know the racket side that much which is why they come to us mm -hmm. but it, it's cool to see those you know the racket nerds come in and, and get to go over all those little specky details and everything yeah. Yeah. That's, that's super cool. Especially with like, um, it's interesting to me how, like, I know it's diadem. So obviously you're going to use the diadem rackets, but it, it's cool how like much just adding some things just to like one racket can change it. Like you take one, like a diadem elevate, but you can make like a million versions of it just by adding your own stuff to it. And I think that's what makes me so interested in it, um, which kind of like translate into my interest in like the pro stock stuff where you have like the, the different layups compared to like the different mold. Like all of that is just, it's kind of mind blowing to me. And um, yeah, I think it's cool that like the whole tracking thing and what you guys are doing is kind of like a gateway into normal people being able to understand that kind of stuff and like take advantage of their own equipment, you know? And that's why I, you know, I'm kind of active on um, one of the Facebook groups, Tennis Nerd, and I try to put all that, those little videos into there and try to educate the public a little bit because there, there's so much misinformation. I, I would like to clear it up and kind of be like, hey, like, you know, maybe you're breaking strings too much because, you know, it's the wrong racket for you or it's the wrong string choice. And, you know, some people are like, oh, where do I need to add weight? Well, you need to know what kind of swing you have and all that kind of stuff that all these different factors that, you know, myself and Dustin see on a regular basis and we're used to changing. It's not so easy when it's doing it yourself in an area you don't really know as well. Right. Yeah, that's cool. Especially that that tennis nerd group, because I'm, I don't, I'm not really active in it, except whenever I sell stuff, but I definitely am reading all the posts on there. And there's some real misinformation that people post. And they're just so confident in their own experience. They're like, oh, it's got to be the same for everyone else. And mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, stuff like that. And where people will ask like, that no clips of seeing them play but they're like hey like i'm a usta four or five give me a racket and it's like you can't do that you can't just wilson pick blade, a racket wilson blade, wilson blade all right like right nine. everyone does oh it's it's ridiculous or they're like pick out a string and attention for me and it's like you can't you can't just like throw things out and then you see all these like racket nerds posting like well this is it this is the one for you and uh, yeah that's it's super interesting that it's funny to me to think that you're reading the same thing and having the same reaction I am with oh yeah oh yeah I mean uh, on one like I get it like it helped them with their game but you know that's limited knowledge they don't understand that it might not help someone else in their game it, it might actually do the opposite it might hurt their game right yeah and in terms of like marketing for racket companies and things that makes me think of the pro staff a lot because it's like they, they're trying to hit every player, but that racket is so like not for every player. And they're like, oh, it's the RF version. That's for me. I'm going to be just like Federer. I have a one-handed backhand and I'm 13 years old. I want to be just like him. And so that it, it's, it's cool to see that like the world's kind of evolving 
um, in that and they're trying to broaden their range um, of stuff. And that's kind of a lot of people um, don't discredit head, but there's so many versions of every head racket and mm -hmm. like there's pros and cons to that. And at first I hated that. Um, and then like I've been using the Gravity Pro and that's kind of what I've settled on. Sure. But what, what's interesting to me is like over time I've thought about it and it's like, they're probably the, the brand with the biggest, like you can walk in and there's going to be something that's going to work. And um, my only issue like, with like companies like Wilson is that they don't have as many like options like that. And it, it's a little bit more confusing for um, like first time buyers on like the head side. But like, I don't know, it seems really interesting to me how different companies take different approaches to creating like lines of rackets, things like that. Oh, for sure. I mean, you can tell what companies are trying to do. Like Head has been pretty innovative, you know, trying to do like the um, adaptive grommet systems that they could change the string pattern. Like that was pretty cool. Uh, that was, was cool. Head at that time, that was, no one else could do that. And then I think the following or the year before that Dunlop had like the IDAP grips where you could change the grips out of the rackets, which unfortunately it was a major fluke because it didn't work. But uh, again, like that's such a cool concept. Yeah. I Do you watch those tennis spin videos? Tennis spin? Um, yeah. On YouTube. Have you seen any of his videos? Right. Oh, you got to check them out. He, he does this thing where he posts a video every day. Um, but they're some of them are really dumb like he'll make like a 10 minute video out of like different types of dampeners and it's like you don't need to do that so some of them are pretty terrible but he talks about i think it's a bolt racket where they created like this new yeah like the new grommet system thing where it's like detached from the actual racket or something so it's so like yeah i haven't actually like researched into it i saw like they're doing a lot of facebook ads and i saw it on there and yeah. I saw something where they were trying to use titanium string to prove that the dampening system was really good. And I was just like, oh, this is cool. But I mean, is it a gimmick? Is it not? Like I'd have to actually test it out and really see before I give an honest opinion on it. Right. Yeah, I'm definitely, that kind of stuff is super interesting to me. And yeah, his channel is cool. You gotta, you gotta check it. There, there's some, there's some good videos, but there's some really um, filler <clears throat> videos on there that you'll find them pretty quick. Uh, but yeah, cool. So um, next I want to talk about how did you get the job at Diadem? How did you kind of like get your foot in the door? And, and I guess you kind of like pioneered the whole like hitting lane thing. So kind of how did that, how did that happen? Um, well, I got to give Dustin the credit for pioneering it and Evan, the, the one of the founders, um, they did most of that. I was there to kind of help along and be a little bit of a, a guinea pig and add some computer knowledge into there. But that, that's all the, the pioneering goes to them. Okay, um, cool. But as for getting a job at Diadem, it was kind of just like a big lucky thing. Um, as you know, I'm always active in so many different groups and all that. And someone posted for a stringing job at the time I was just doing some part-time coaching. Uh, it was like just out of COVID and, and I was like, Oh, this, this is a little far, but you know, maybe I'll, I'll try it out. And then Dustin messaged me. He was like, Hey, um, we're a little closer. Um, I could use some help stringing and diet him. Why don't you stop by and, and let's talk about it. Um, he actually knew one of my first coaches, Jason, who gave me a, a great recommendation and hit it off. And so I go in there and the whole time I'm thinking, man, this is like a half hour away from where I live. It's a little far. I, I can't see myself taking this job. So we go into the warehouse and like, this is where they ship everything from. Like, Oh, this is pretty cool. They show me some old prototype rackets. Well, they, uh, Dustin shows me some old prototype rackets and you know, there's some like just some of their first designs ever. It was, it was pretty cool, but it was still like cool, but still a half hour away, all this. And then we go into the, the main headquarters and I see the hitting and I'm like, okay, you got all these cameras, the, the indoor court, the whole headquarters just looked super cool. And he's like, so you want to hit some? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Why not? So he, he gets me into the, the hitting lane. He starts messing around with my weight and everything to see, I guess, you know, what knowledge I had on that. And he starts putting me in like, just like we do the hitting sessions with all the different weight customizations, more in the handle, more in the top, more in the throat, all that kind of different stuff. And I was just blown away once he put on the nodes and he started tracking everything. I was like, this is, I can't turn this down. Like there's, there's no possible way I can turn this down no matter what. 
and that was it. I just, after that, it just took off from there. And, you know, Dustin has been trying his, his best to work on the hitting lane. We're trying to figure out everything. And it, it's been a long couple of months, but it, it's the coolest opportunity I've gotten in, in the MRT world. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, yeah, I'm really, I'm, I'm excited to see what else you guys, uh, produce and any sort of videos and things like that you you post about that kind of stuff um so I was kind of curious I guess we kind of already touched on it like briefly but what kind of players um do you think can take advantage of it do you think even like the lower level like recreational players would have any benefit in going to do something like that or would it just be more of the, the higher level so it can benefit everyone um for sure, no matter what your level is, we can always find a racket that's going to help you swing. Um, it's that's a no-brainer. Um, I think the biggest thing is if it's worth it to you. Do you really want to take the time? If you're just a recreational player who might not really care about improving, but you're just there to goof off with your friends, like maybe not. But for anyone who really wants to improve their game, you know, competitive juniors in South Florida, they should be all over there. It's it's the easiest way to get your racket customized. We don't just do it with item rackets. We would do it with any racket. And it's, in my mind, it's a no brainer. If you're a competitive junior or even a competitive adult, you this is something you have to do. Cool. Yeah, I'm, I, I feel like there's this stigma around like customization. That's like, oh, that's only for the pros or, oh, I can find a racket right off the shelf. That's like perfect for me. So I'm, I feel like we kind of need to, shy away from that and i think that this is like a perfect opportunity to introduce people to what it can do what it can do yeah it's cool for sure like a lot of you know I, I work with a lot of high level juniors and some of them don't have any weight on their rackets as like 17 year old boys they they hit the ball hard man they they can hit just as hard as the pros and they're using stock weight rackets at like 10 5 or 10 8 sometimes 11.2 but that's, that's not enough weight for them to be returning serves and being able to penetrate the ball through the court. They, they really need to add something and help them with their game. Right. Yeah, that's cool. And especially with the, those players that are getting up into like the, like 120 serves and stuff. Um, it kind of blows me away sometimes when I, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of like the ITA circuit thing. So that that's pretty big in Texas. Um, so my friend and I, I mean, I'm not nearly good enough to like actually do anything at those tournaments, but it's fun to go play a couple of rounds. Um, and, and one of those things that really blew, like blew me away is um, how little like they're aware of what they're using. Like I'm watching some of these kids play and I can't remember what his name was, but I remember I looked him up and he was like an 11.5, maybe a 12 UTR. And he was playing with like a V-Core 100 and was like blasting everything out, like every ball that if he missed, it was 10 feet out. And I'm like, yeah. why, why are you using it? Like you're, you're hitting the ball harder than like any pro that I've watched in person. Like, why are you doing something like that? And it's super interesting to me that like, I don't know why people haven't gotten into it or especially why juniors haven't gotten into it. Um, but I, I, my hope is that some of those big racket brands start to like, I don't know, advertise it some more or just kind of explain that like, this is a, this is an option for all these players out there. Cause I think a lot of people are not taking advantage of, of the rackets they have. I, honestly, I think it should come down to the coaches. Um, the coaches need to have a little more knowledge, even if they're not the ones who know it, they should be hooked up with a stringer or someone that can point them in the right direction of where to go and how to get them customized because they're, they're the experts. They're the ones leading the kids and telling them what to do. If your expert isn't telling you the best things possible for your game, then how are you going to know? All right. That actually leads into something I wanted to add on to this little thing. So um, they have like the, the coaches conventions all over every state um, every year. And so the Michigan one, um, I actually asked if I could do a, like a 20 minute presentation on helping some of the coaches understand rackets and string to help explain them to the players. So, um, to prepare for that, I guess I wanted to kind of ask for your guidance and what you've um, gone through the things that I wanted to touch on mainly was for the string side is that if your player is playing on varsity, that poly is 99% of what they should be using. Um, and I, cause I know for me at the club that I'm stringing at a lot of these high school kids are playing with synthetic gut at like 60 pounds. It's the most mind blowing thing I've ever seen. And they're shredding strings in like a couple days. Um, and so in terms of like recommending gauges and things like that, how, how would you go about presenting that to a bunch of high school coaches? 
<sighs> that's that's a pretty loaded question. Um, yeah, because there's so many different answers, so many different ways to go about it and make it work. Um, so actually I'm a big proponent of synthetic gut still. I use it for a lot of my younger juniors. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a great learning string. It's kind of like training wheels. I want to mm -hmm. see how well you can ride with it before we don't need them anymore. Um, but once you go past that and you're starting to break it, you know, every three weeks, every four weeks or whatever, then it's time to start going into a hybrid. Um, I think the best way to go about it is to kind of give them maybe even just give them like a sheet of paper, like a timeline thing. Like if they're breaking, you know, synthetic gut strings in every three weeks, let's think about going into a hybrid. If they're breaking a hybrid in every three weeks, maybe we shift the hybrid where you start them out with synthetic gut in the mains and poly in the crosses or multi in the mains and poly in the crosses. And then if they're breaking that, you change the hybrid around. Then once they're breaking that, then you can go into a full bed at a thin gauge. Um, you know, just give them steps and a timeline where it, it's kind of foolproof. It, it still might not be the best advice for everyone, but at least it's a blanket statement that will be able to help everyone more than, you know, just, hey, send that I got every two days. Right. Yeah, I really, I like that idea of the, of the timeline. I think one thing that I've run into um, when talking to people at this, at this club, and I'm that in Michigan, you need to be a part of an indoor club if you're playing a lot because it's because it snows for half the year. So you get a ton of high school players coming in, and they it's not nearly as hot, so strings don't pop as much either. Um, and it like everything's indoors, so it's way more flat. It, it's just it, it's a whole different sport there than here in Texas. But um, I, I found it interesting that I saw almost all 16 gauge poly if they brought it in, if it, that rarely if they bring it in, and that kind of blew my mind because. I would like, they wouldn't break it for three or four months and then they just restring it again. And I'm like, that's not how it should be. Like you should be breaking in about three or four weeks or you should go down and gauge. So I definitely want to touch on that with the coaches because I feel like the coaches are like, oh, go buy a poly string and 16 gauge for some reason is the most popular. Um, so what would you recommend for a kid going from that hybrid with, um, to, a, to a full bed? Would you go straight from the hybrid to like an 18 gauge or would you go to like a 17? So I, I would start off with a thin gauge hybrid. And once they're breaking that, you go up gauge, gauge, gauge. Um, I, I wouldn't go to 15 gauge in a hybrid um, unless you're a really big hitter. It doesn't really make sense. I think 16 L would probably be the best bet for going highest, but e even 16 for some players isn't a bad idea. Um, and then, you know, once they go through that, then transition them into, I would say a 17 gauge power. Um, but you know, you'll have some players that want to stick in a hybrid and you keep going up in the gauges and they stick with it. You know, some players don't like playing with a full bed of poly and mm -hmm. it really depends on their swing style. Like we've touched on before. So yeah, you have to kind of give them blanket statements that allow them to have options to go to. So that way it's not just you telling them, okay, this is the way it's more of, Hey, try this. But also if it doesn't work, we can do this, give them options on everyone. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have thought more so of the hybrid idea. Um, that makes sense. I, well, in terms of like, uh, if you didn't take a synthetic gut, in terms of like a multi, what have you seen? Like what string would you recommend the most or seen, I guess, seen out in the, on the courts the most um, for like the multi? For multi-filaments, um, I mean, you know, NXT is probably one of the most popular. Um, I, I have to give Diadem a shout out. Impulse is a great option as well. Um, it basically just feels like a more dense NXT, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's a weird way to describe it, but it, it's personally, I, I feel like most multis feel pretty similar. There's some really mm -hmm. bad ones out there, don't get me wrong, but <laughs> yes, most there are. High end multi filaments all feel pretty similar. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think yeah, I, I did my own stream business thing here in Texas for a while, just kind of like, whoever calls me cool. And I think that I, I probably sold the most impulse out of everything. Um, and it was because I had so many people who were complaining about the fraying on the NXT. And I'm like, dude, and like, it looks terrible. It does. I like, I personally could not play with a racket like that. It just looks gross. <laughs> so I, I was like, many complaints along the way. Yes. Rackets. My, my strings are defective. They're, they're fraying all of it. No, that's good. That means you're doing a great job. Yeah. Oh, but I want it changed out. Can you do it for free? <laughs> so sorry. Like, this is how the string works. I'll do this one for free, but just so you know, this is 
how this string works. It's just the nature of the beast. Right. And I think that's one thing I'm going to mention uh, because it is so popular. So I think that's one thing I'm going to mention at that um, at that conference, because I've seen so many people who like, as soon as it starts to fray, they're like, oh, it's time to restring it. And it's like, no, like, like it's supposed to be doing that. Like, that's a good sign. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think NXT has caused me so many problems with people who were like, oh, I got a defective string. You gave me a bad pack. You just strung it wrong, whatever. So that, that's funny to hear that you've <laughs> had people who did the same thing. Oh, so many. I used to work at country clubs back in New York, and that was a, a very common complaint. Yeah, cool. Um, so you, you, I guess you've done a lot of stringing too. Um, did you, yeah. did you ever do that as like a solo job, or did was it always kind of paired with coaching? Um, it was. I mean, I guess technically, when I was in high school, I did it solo for a tiny little bit, but it's mostly always been paired with coaching. Um, like I strung for my college team. Um, but again, I, I was coaching as well. So I vote, I, I'm just, I just work as many, as much as I can. So, yeah. Well, and I saw you at the orange bowl. You made a, you made a Facebook post, what, right. It was, was it the orange bowl or the Easter bowl? I think it was orange bowl, right? Yeah. Um, so it's kind of cool to see that you're still doing tournament stuff. Do you, do you enjoy doing the tournament stringing or is that not, not really your thing? Um, Sometimes more than others, like I did the U.S. Open uh, juniors a couple years ago, and that was with my buddy Jason, who knew Dustin. Um, that was a lot of fun. Um, the Orange Bowl, I was only there part time because I had just taken a new job coaching, so I couldn't take the time off that I wanted to. So it wasn't exactly the same. It was still cool, a great experience, but it wasn't the same as, you know, being there the whole time and stringing until your fingers literally bleed and getting everything done. Mm -hmm. cool so for the last question just out of my own curiosity I, I assume you've strung on many machines um of all types what would you say is your favorite out of all of them um i honestly i think i would have to say that bayardo is my favorite just because of the height requirements yep, um, me too <laughs> yeah like i think i can string the fastest on the, the alpha ghost um but it's I'm bending over a lot and it's, it's not great for the back. Yeah. Um, I would love if they could make a, a combination of those two machines where, you know, the Bayardo had the table lock and I could still get the height from it. And it had the Bayardo. Like, I think I love almost everything about the Bayardo except for the, um, I don't like how it doesn't lock when it's, when you're yes. pulling. I, I was shocked that that wasn't even a feature. Like I, like, I didn't even know that was a feature on any machine until I saw that, that new Selenko machine at Kalamazoo. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, like, that's a thing. That's cool. And then I realized, like, why does the Bayardo not have that? That doesn't make any sense. Because that's that, that's a really cool feature. I, it hadn't occurred to me, like, to even do something like that. But that, that's so much better for the string for it to auto lock the, the table. So I'm, I'm, and I really want to try out that new Selenko machine, to be honest. I know it looks like the, like a new ghost. I mean, is it like a ghost the two, ghost thing. three? Yeah, like a head one. Yeah, that's what it was. The like the little tension head that like pops up whenever yeah, it pulls back. Bird's eye or whatever they call it. Bird bird beak. Yeah. Whatever. Right. That thing looks kind of interesting to me. I wonder, do you know why they do that? Is there like a benefit that you know? Um, personally, I saw some of the videos. I wasn't a fan of how it if you watch the string actually like lift it up a little bit. So I, uh -huh. I don't really like that part of it. Um it looks like a cool feature. I don't know why you would do it, but I, I anytime the, the string elevates more than the frame, I'm always a little bit hesitant because I don't want anything slipping, popping, whatever. Just right. make it even and call it a day. Yeah. From like an aesthetic standpoint, it looks kind of cool, but like, yeah, yeah. Like, especially I would think if it like breaks down, like how would you fix something like that? Like, I feel like fixing a Bayardo tension head would be way easier but I don't know. That's definitely a machine I want to, I want to try out. So I was wondering if you've ever experienced that, but no, I mean, I, I got to give Selenko a lot of credit. They do some, some really good stuff. Um, but you know, I can't give you an honest opinion until I try it. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, um, that's kind of the end of this, that that goes through all my questions. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me and, 
and uh you know you you've always been really supportive of all the of all the endeavors that i'm trying to do so really appreciate that <laughs> yeah, i got the same support when i was your age and trying to make my way through so i just trying to pay it forward and give the next person their their clear path to go cool thank you uh do you want to like shout out your instagram or or anything like that up to uh, you sure. um uh, south florida tennis is my instagram um if you need to email me uh south florida coaching at gmail.com it's about Sweet. it yeah i i follow your instagram i like i love the i love the stuff you put on there so try. um cool <laughs> cool well thank you adam thanks for talking with me and uh hope to hear from you again soon yeah of course anytime pal have a good one thanks, man. Bye.